The osprey, locally called fishhawk, is one of New Jersey's largest birds of prey. Not so long ago, it was an unusual sight in most of New Jersey. The population had declined from 500 pairs in the 1950s to only about 50 pairs in the early 70s. Pesticides applied heavily to New Jersey's coast before 1972 circulated through the food chain and reached the osprey and the fish it ate. Additionally, the birds found fewer and suitable nesting sites. People flocked to New Jersey to enjoy its beaches and its boating and fishing recreation. They developed thousands of acres of wetlands for homes. Fortunately for coastal wildlife, the Wetlands Act of 1972 now protects the tide marsh from development, but many potential osprey breeding sites had already been lost. Contaminants caused osprey to produce eggs which were too thin-shelled to withstand incubation or to provide protection for the developing chick. The natural habitat was replaced by man-made structures. With no place to nest and a limited ability to produce viable eggs, the magnificent fish-eating hawk of New Jersey was gradually disappearing from the coast. In 1974, the newly formed New Jersey Endangered and Non-Game Species Program began doing surveys to determine the size and health of the osprey population. Little was known about the biology of ospreys, and new facts became pieces in the puzzle whose solution would save the osprey from extinction in New Jersey. Helicopters and airplanes were indispensable in surveying the whole state, and nests were found on many structures along the coast. It was clear that the birds had begun adapting to the loss of their traditional nesting sites by using some of the very structures which encroached on their habitat. Many times the ospreys seek out telephone poles or use electric lines. Sometimes the birds are located on the top of observation towers. The osprey is an extremely adaptable bird when it comes to nesting, but it must have an aerial platform. However, since one of the limiting factors was availability of structures in isolated places, the Endangered Non-Game Species Program launched a project to supply the osprey with nesting places on protected and isolated marshlands. In the early years, the poles were constructed by volunteers and installed on the marsh by hand. This was hard work. Poles frequently weighed over a half a ton, and it took two, three, four, five men to carry these poles out across the bays and onto the marsh to put them up. Then they had to be jetted down deep into the mud to make them stable. This work was usually done during the winter and help was volunteer labor. Over several winters, the program developed its own design for osprey nesting poles. And this design is being used all over New Jersey and in other states. The New Jersey design provides a basket which protects the nest from storm winds and provides a perching area at each corner for the adult osprey during the nesting months. The osprey nesting poles were later delivered to marsh islands by helicopter, saving time and manpower. The osprey prefers a raised structure for nesting, and the pole raises the platform at least 12 feet above the marsh. Using the efficiency of aerial delivery and installation, the program could install four or five remote nesting structures in a day. Putting the osprey poles up on the marsh when it was frozen was very practical. However, it was cold work. We utilized borrowed equipment and the cooperation of the utility companies to help with some of the osprey poles.
Over the years from 1975 to 1981, more than 60 artificial nesting structures were placed. These were well accepted by the osprey, who sometimes abandoned less desirable nesting sites for the artificial nests. In spite of increased nesting opportunity, the pesticide contamination problem remained. Nest checks revealed loss of productivity due to infertile or thin-shelled eggs in most of the nests in Barnegat Bay and in a significant number of nests elsewhere in the state. Getting to the nest was frequently a problem. Again, the helicopter was used. Most often, though, we used a boat going across the bays and then climbing the poles with an extension ladder. Due to high levels of DDT and other pesticides, New Jersey ospreys were laying eggs with shells too thin to withstand the weight of the incubating birds, causing them to break in the nest. We would climb the pole shortly after the eggs were laid and carefully record the numbers of eggs in the nest. Sometimes the ospreys would dive at us as they attempted to protect their nest from the unwelcome intruders. A record was kept of the hatching success of each egg and the disposition of every nest during the study. Infertile eggs were analyzed in the laboratory and found to contain high levels of organochlorine compounds. It was thought that these chemicals would eventually disappear from the environment, but meanwhile there was a serious problem. Osprey, like many birds of prey, are faithful to their place of rearing and usually return to the same area when they prepare to breed at the age of two or three years. If the osprey of New Jersey did not produce young for a decade or more, there would be little chance for replacement of aging pairs. The program decided to try a new idea to replace New Jersey's infertile eggs with the eggs of fertile pairs from a healthy population. With the help of the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, nests were chosen in the Chesapeake Bay and Potomac River. Permits to do the transfer of eggs were obtained from the Maryland Agency and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The plan was also endorsed and partially funded by federal aid to endangered species. Ospreys in Maryland have chosen remote sites over water to raise their young. Such nests are well protected from most predators and seem to be left undisturbed by passing boaters. Almost every channel marker and duck blind in the area of collection was occupied by a pair of osprey. One of the nice parts about collecting eggs in the Chesapeake Bay was that the nests were easy to find. The hard part was going out and getting to them. Many times we had to wait a day or two for the weather to be mild enough to allow us to get to the channel markers and then we either had to put a ladder up or climb the markers to remove the eggs. Only one day was required to take the eggs. The nests were visited during the morning hours by boat, starting at daylight, and the biologists would climb the channel marker structure. Sometimes climbing into these nests can be a risky business because when you're up on top, there's no way to protect yourself from the diving birds. We had to be extra careful when taking the eggs from the Chesapeake Bay. Taking the eggs in Chesapeake proved to be a very successful program. No eggs were broken during the transplant, and in one day's time, we were able to take enough eggs to supply our needs for that particular year. Many different styles of channel markers were visited to collect the eggs. While we were collecting the eggs from the nest, we found barn owls and all other types of wildlife using these channel markers. In every case, we took the entire clutch. This stimulated the birds to relay, and the production of the Chesapeake Bay Ospreys was not affected by the removal of the early clutches. Usually within a few moments after we left, the birds would return to inspect the nest.
For four years, between 1975 and 1978, we collected eggs from 10 to 15 nests. Each clutch was identified and stored together. A warm transport incubator was used to return the eggs to New Jersey. Several launchings were necessary to cover the area of the egg taking in the Chesapeake Bay. Within eight hours, the Osprey eggs were taken from the Chesapeake Bay and returned to New Jersey. Over a period of five years, fertile Osprey eggs were brought from the Chesapeake Bay to New Jersey to help reestablish the Osprey population along the Jersey coast. Within 24 hours, some of the eggs had been placed in a permanent incubator in New Jersey. Others were placed in New Jersey nests. Sometimes it was difficult to get to the nesting sites. However, by boat, by walking, by canoe, and even by helicopter, we were able to put the Maryland eggs into the nest where they would be incubated by the New Jersey ospreys. Sometimes it was easier than others. It was simply a matter of climbing a pole and putting the Maryland eggs in the nest and removing the Osprey's original eggs, which were sent to the Patuxent Research Station for analysis. Sometimes we used a utility company's cherry picker to get up into the nest, which would be otherwise inaccessible for the egg transplant. In every case, the adult Osprey accepted the replacement eggs and began incubating them. After several weeks of incubation, the Maryland eggs hatched. The hatching of an osprey egg is an extremely slow process. Sometimes two or three hours are required for the chick to break the shell and work its way out. In some instances, they do not hatch at all. The young simply do not have the strength to survive. This is nature's way of ensuring that only the strongest and the most viable chicks will begin life. Some of the Maryland eggs hatched in the incubator, and these young were fed once, then placed in the nest of an osprey, which hatched less than two chicks. Since osprey can easily raise two chicks when food is plentiful, this allowed pairs to raise an optimum number in a season. Some ospreys have failed to produce chicks for several years prior to the chick transfer due to infertility or the eggs breaking under the incubating bird. The question was whether these ospreys, which hadn't seen chicks in several years, would recognize and accept the two-day-old chicks which we were putting in their nests. Observation after chick transfer showed that the osprey pairs readily accepted new chicks and usually returned to the nest within 20 minutes of the transfer. Feeding followed within a few hours. As a result of this early work, it was found that the chick transfers were very successful. After 1978, because of increased natural production and the successful return of adults from transferred Maryland eggs, the egg transfer was discontinued. The limited transfer of chicks became the best method of managing the species to maximize productivity. Extra chicks from large clutches would be doomed to a natural death by starvation due to sibling competition, so young chicks from nests with three or four chicks were moved to the nests of pairs whose eggs did not hatch. 
This proved to be very successful in assuring the fledging of all the chicks. The chick transplant program resulted in ex an extra production of young ospreys, which provided the broodstock for the beginning of the natural return of the osprey to Barnegat Bay. Nests which previously produced only one young chick were now producing two and sometimes three due to the chick and the egg transplant program. Osprey chicks grow from almost naked hatchlings into feathered fledglings very fast. After 40 days of incubation, the chick hatches. From that point on, the parents spend most of their time brooding, hunting, and feeding the young. Within 45 days, the young osprey have developed their feathers in full adult size, and they are ready to fly. They spend some days stretching and exercising their wings, then experiment with flight. But just before the osprey take to the wing, the program biologists banned every accessible nestling in the state. The height of some nests and the type of structures holding them sometimes makes banding a hair-raising experience. The parents are defensive and frequently swoop at the banders in an effort to chase away the intruder. Some ospreys were more aggressive than others. Sometimes special equipment and daring are necessary to reach especially difficult nests. For one especially high nest, the biologist was airlifted by helicopter into the nest and dropped off to ban the young birds. While in the nest, the biologist was exposed to the defensive behavior of the adults, and there were some anxious moments until the helicopter returned. Using the helicopter to get to nest was discontinued when shorter poles were erected, making it more convenient and also safer to climb them with a ladder. Over the years, special equipment and expertise were offered by various utility companies who had osprey nesting on their facilities. During the course of the study, we never had a serious accident due to the osprey striking an individual. However, we did have some close calls. Utility company transmission towers provided unique man-made nesting habitat for a dozen pairs of ospreys in New Jersey. The birds elected to nest on the same cross structure member, 65 feet high on each of the utility poles. Information from banding is very helpful in determining the migration patterns, the mortality rates, and for getting good basic information on the biology of these wonderful birds. The young osprey are banded with a numbered aluminum band supplied by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We send information about the banded birds to the Federal Bird Banding Laboratory, where it is computerized. If the bird is later captured or found injured or dead, its history can be documented. Facts about migration and life history result from this system of bird identification. The Osprey Management Program has been a shining success. 
In the first eight years of the program, the osprey population in New Jersey has doubled. Previously, infertile pairs are again able to successfully reproduce, and birds produced from the original transplants are making their homes on our coastline. Productivity has reached a level which will sustain the population, and continued transplants are unnecessary. The program may be useful in other states where the osprey population has suffered serious declines. Ospreys occasionally suffer misfortune and need the direct intervention of people to save their lives. Qualified volunteers and organizations have worked to rehabilitate ospreys injured by collisions with wires, affected by weather-related accidents, or weakened by disease or hunger. Rehabilitation is a difficult job and requires knowledge and commitment but it is rewarding when one of these birds recovers and flies free again. This work on the osprey is just one example of what is being done by the state's Division of Fish, Game, and Wildlife's Endangered and Non-Game Species Program in New Jersey. Work is presently being done on all endangered species, from the bald eagle and the peregrine falcon to the little pine barren tree frog and the secretive tiger salamander. All of this work is funded entirely by the donations of the citizens of New Jersey through the Checkoff for Wildlife on their state income tax form. The endangered and non-game wildlife in New Jersey need your help.